and the recordings for these sessions are made available on the uh, companion guide for the series, which I'm going to put in the chat box. Uh, so this has recordings and slides from the prior sessions, and it's where I'll be posting future recordings and slides. Uh, as a reminder, um, if you'd like, so you can sign up for these sessions either through the Himmelfarb website, which maybe many of you found the session in that way, or if you want to be added to my email list, uh, you can send me an email at that address, tph at gwu.edu, and I'll add you to the list. And what that means is just before each one of these sessions, I send an email to everyone on the list as a reminder that the session is coming up. Um, so what we're going to be looking at today is formulating a search strategy. So to put this in context of the rest of the sessions we've done, um, Here's what we've done so far, types of reviews, Prisma, developing a research question. Now we're going to take the next step, which is formulating a search strategy based on your research question. Um, so I will be watching the chat. So if you have questions or comments, I will uh, try to keep an eye on the chat. So I've got that going on my screen here um, and I'll try to uh, get back with you as, as quickly as I can if you have a question, uh, or you can just turn on your mic and uh, communicate that way. Either way is fine with me. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. The outline for what I want to talk about today uh, is this. So beginning with a research question and a PICO PO statement. So this is something we talked about in the session last time, but I'll give a little bit of a review. And then transitioning this to a search strategy. Um, and you'll see why I spent a whole session talking about research questions and PICO and PO and all that sort of thing. Um, you'll get a better sense of why I talked about that because it really leads us into this next step, which is developing a search strategy. Um, and then I'm going to finish with the role of the librarians, because this is one of those topics where uh, librarians are often heavily involved. And so I want to encourage anyone who's performing a systematic review, if you want to work with the librarian, and many of my colleagues and I have gone through specific training um, in assisting with systematic reviews and and so it's something that we can definitely help with i've met with people one-on-one -on -one, you know a one-time session and then i never hear from them again or uh it's an ongoing thing and i become you know some of them i've it's my contribution has risen to the level of co-author even i mean but it doesn't have to be that it can be kind of everything in between and so I want to talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, but what we're going to begin with is the research question and PICO and PO. Oops. So if you'll remember from last time, this is where we ended up. It was taking a research topic and developing a question because a systematic review is about answering a question. That's the goal of a systematic review um, in medical terms, that's typically answering, you know, some clinically relevant question, but it's, it can be, this is applicable to all fields, um, but you really need a question that you're answering. And it doesn't mean that that's the sole focus. You know, it may be that that question kind of implies a lot of things, which will be a sub analysis of what you're doing. Um, but it means that you should have a question. The question will then suggest either a PICO or a PO statement. So PICO is uh, population intervention control outcome. So it's a way of parsing out your research question and pulling out the key concepts. That's PICO. PO, so many of you are probably familiar with PICO, so you've heard of that. PO is less familiar but that is population exposure outcome. It's often used in public health actually as a, a, a way of framing public health systematic review questions. Um, so for the one that I was looking at, the one where we, where we ended last week, it was how have COVID related disruptions affected the physical activity levels of elderly individuals in the US 
living and skilled care facilities. This to me was more of a PO thing. So I converted it to that. So the population here is elderly and really more specifically elderly who live in skilled care facilities. Um, uh, the exposure is COVID, but again, it's, this is something I talked about last time is when you do something like this, it raises as many questions as it answers. So when I say elderly, what do I mean by elderly? And I settled on the idea of elderly who are living in skilled care facilities. For COVID, what do I mean by that? People who have had COVID or just folks who live in the era of COVID? Um, and I settled on the idea of COVID related disruptions to life. So not individuals who had COVID, but those who just live through that time period. And then an outcome. In this case, my outcome was exercise or physical activity, but I'd wanna think about what I mean by that. Um, when I say outcome, when I say physical activity, do I mean like programmed exercise or do I mean going for a walk every day? Uh, individually guide, you know, self-guided exercise. Do it, does it have to be exercise or can it be broadly physical activity? I'd want to think about those things. And it's good to think about those things early on because we'll see in later sessions, we're going to talk about um, when you screen articles, having inclusion exclusion criteria and the inclusion exclusion criteria are typically, and I, I don't want to spoil it too much because I'll talk much more about it then, but there are elements of PO that specify the question. So, um, and it's a way of cutting down on um, confounding variables. So I want to know the specific, because I remember I'm trying to answer a question and if I have too many confounding variables, then I have just a pile of what ifs or me in this case it's this answer in this case it's that answer and it becomes too complicated and so i want to specify my research question so that i can answer it at the end without having too many confounding variables but anyway um that was where we ended up in this session last time i had a research idea i converted that to a question and then i converted that to a po statement or a po framework the reason I do that, and I alluded to this last time, was a PO framework will suggest a search strategy. So it takes you to the next step um, going through it in this way. And so the way that works, uh, again, my PO, now we're transitioning to a search strategy. Here's my PO. This is basically the formula. Uh, P and E and O. That would be how I would start to create my search. For Pico, it's P and I or C and O. Um, that's how you, the general strategy for converting a Pico or a PO statement into a, a search strategy. And what I mean by search strategy are the actual string of terms that I'm going to plug into PubMed and other databases to identify articles. Um, so for mine, again, this is my question. This is would be how that would convert. So it's COVID was my exposure. My outcome was physical activity and my population was the elderly. It doesn't matter what order I have them in. It's the results are going to be the same. Um, and so before I get into that, this would be, I can walk you through this process a little bit of having a basic search and then um, so let me open up another a browser here which I'm going to share uh, and we'll see how what this looks like so I'm going to go to PubMed through Himmelfarb and plug in my search here so this is COVID and elderly and physical activity. This is a very basic search. Obviously, this is not the finished product by a long shot. But the way that I do this typically is we do a basic search, we identify some good articles, and then we fish terms out of those articles to fill out the search. So if I do this search, 
It's a thousand articles. Um, so that, so like this one, impact, impact of social isolation due to COVID-19 on health and older people, mental and physical effects and recommendations. So kind of seems like it's on topic for me. Um, you know, and you can look through and see other articles that may be on topic. So I'd want to identify um, multiple what I call exemplar articles and fish out terms. And what I mean by fishing out terms is going to the article and reading the title and reading the abstract to come up with title abstract terms, because that's how one of the ways of searching PubMed is searching title abstract terms. So saying, telling PubMed, look for this term in the titles and abstracts of articles. I came up with some initial terms, COVID, elderly, and physical activity, but I would want to fish out what are other synonyms for that. Um, so there's a couple of ways I can do that. One is doing this process of fishing out um, terms from titles and abstracts of exemplar articles. So for instance, uh, a synonym for COVID is coronavirus. So I'd want to include that. A synonym for elderly is older people or aging, or I know aged is another one. There are other synonyms for that. For physical activity, I don't know if it says in here, but like exercise, something like that. Here we go, exercise. Um, so that's a perhaps synonymous term with physical activity. So I'm fishing out synonymous terms from the titles and abstracts. The next part is to look at the mesh terms for the article. So as a slight kind of mesh detour, uh, for those who may not be familiar, mesh is stands for medical subject headings. And they are a set of terms which are, um, it's called the controlled vocabulary. And what it means is that for every concept, the folks at the National Library of Medicine pick one term for that concept. Uh, so for elderly, the mesh term is aged. That's, that's their synonym for elderly. And the reason they do that, and then they, someone will look at every article. So someone read this article and they, looked in the, someone at the National Library of Medicine, they picked 20 or so mesh terms to apply to it. And that's what these are. The reason they do that is that by every article that's about older people being tagged with the mesh term aged means that if I search the mesh term aged, I'll find all the related articles, whether they use the term older people, elderly, aged, seniors, whatever synonym they use, they're all indexed under this accepted mesh term. So it's one term that encapsulates all of that. And if I know what that term is, I can find all the related articles, regardless of which synonym the authors of the article choose. Because you can imagine for this elderly, aged, senior, older adults, there's a lot of synonymous terms or roughly synonymous terms that an author might choose. And so the, but if I search for this, I'm gonna capture all of them. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, this isn't a session about mesh, so I don't wanna go too in too much detail. But what I, I fished out title abstract terms above, I'm also gonna fish out mesh terms because when I do a systematic review search, I combine mesh terms with title abstract terms. And so you think, well, if mesh terms are so great, what's the point? Isn't it redundant to do both? You know, if I find this term, I just search that. I don't have to figure out all the synonyms because that's the point of mesh terms. And in a way that's correct, but there's an issue with uh, PubMed and that is when journals submit articles to PubMed, the titles and the abstracts get posted immediately. So whatever journal this is, they sent in their table of contents with their titles and abstracts, PubMed just posted that. It takes time for someone to come along and put mesh terms on it. So I'm not sure how old this article is. Um, 2020, so last year. Um, it took time before someone at the National Library of Medicine was able to sit down, read the article and apply terms. So if you only search by mesh terms, 
you will miss the most recent articles because they have no mesh terms. Um, so if I was to find articles, you know, published last month, they almost none of them would have mesh terms because the folks at National Library of Medicine, they haven't gotten around to it yet. Um, so that's why I combine mesh terms with title abstract terms. Hopefully that makes sense for a complete strategy. And that's where the search strategy for a systematic review is different from what you're probably used to. So in what you're probably used to is I want to find an article that answers this question. So maybe mesh terms are fine then. I'm not in systematic review, I want to find every article on this topic. So I have to be exhaustive. I have to, you know, exhaust every avenue, mesh terms, title abstract terms, every synonym I can think of. And so I don't miss anything. So you can see that's part of the process is fishing out terms. Another way of doing it is just to look up the mesh terms on your own. So if I go to PubMed, I'll just do this in another window. I scroll down, I can go to the mesh database. And if I want to know what's the mesh term for physical activity, I type in my term physical activity, and I find that the mesh term for physical activity is exercise. So if I was concerned whether this was right, I could read their definition and say, is that what I mean? And Let's say yes, that's what I mean. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. So that's how I start to fish out terms um, that are synonymous. And so that leads us to this, which is now I'm starting to fill out my search strategy. This is still just a first pass at it. So you can see what I did here was I found the mesh term for COVID is COVID-19, and then I put in squared brackets mesh because I'm telling PubMed, look for this term among the mesh terms, or SARS-CoV-2, that's another mesh term that I thought, okay, I'll look for that as well. Or look for the word COVID in the titles and abstracts, so that's squared brackets, T-I-A-B. And you can see how I started with COVID physical activity elderly, now it's becoming a little more complicated and thorough. Um, COVID-19 mesh, SARS-CoV-2 mesh, and similar to exercise, because I found that was the proper term for, that was the mesh term for physical activity. For every mesh term, I try to have a corresponding title abstract term, so exercise mesh or exercise TIAB, so title abstract. Because remember, these are two, those are the two things I'm asking PubMed to search. Search the titles and abstracts and search the mesh terms. And then my original was physical activities or physical activity title abstract. But you can see what I did here is physical activity with an asterisk. For title abstract terms, you can put an asterisk and it will tells PubMed look for every form of this word. So activity, activities, <clears throat> so singular and plural, or if there's other forms, I can't think of any other word that begins A-C-T-I-V-I-T, -I -I except for activity and activities. Um, no, I was going to activate. No, that's not. But, um, <clears throat> but you can see how I combined. And then the same thing, I wanted to find the mesh term was aged. I had elderly, but I looked it up, and the mesh term is aged, which I picked out of that article. I wanted a corresponding title abstract term for that aged, or my original term, which is elderly, but I would really want to fill this out with or older people, TIAB, or seniors, TIAB. Um, I would want to think of all the synonyms that an author might use. And some of those can come from the articles. So for instance, uh, older people, I might put that as a TIAB. I know the I know that the mesh term for older people is aged, so I don't have to look for to see if there's a corresponding mesh term because I already know what it is, but I would still want to look for this as a title abstract term. So hopefully that makes sense is it's a very different way of doing searches and it's why systematic reviews can be very time consuming up front because you really have to spend a lot of time getting the language right. 
um, and this is just the PubMed search. As you know, as many of you know, with systematic reviews, you're looking at more than one database. You should be looking at more than one database. So after I develop the PubMed search, I would want to change the syntax so that it could be a search in Scopus or Cochrane or CINAHL or some other article database. Um, because this, if I cut and paste this into PubMed, it will read this. It'll understand what I'm saying. The squared brackets, the TIAB, the parentheses, it understands all of this, the asterisk. But if I cut and paste this into Scopus, it's gonna give me an error message because Scopus doesn't read the syntax squared bracket mesh. It will say, no idea what that means. Zero articles or search error in your search. Um, so it has to be reformatted for other databases. So the process that I go through, um, and I see there's a question which I will come to in one moment, is multiple iterations. You saw how I started with this, and my first pass it became this. I looked at Mesh, I looked at um, an exemplar article, but I would want to do more of that. You don't just look at one exemplar, I advise looking at, you know, maybe five to ten of them, farm out more terms, synonyms that you want to feed into your search, and then keep doing this. And you keep doing it until you're quote unquote done. Um, so the knowing when you're done is hard, of course, because you don't, it's impossible to say, have I identified every relevant synonym? I would say someone, you could consider yourself done if you look and if you look through a whole bunch of articles and you don't find any words that you haven't already found, um, that's when I would say, okay, you probably exhausted all the relevant terms here. There are other means which I suggest to someone, which I suggest to people when doing this for real, um, which I won't get into here, but they have to do with looking up I mean, I won't, I'll say it, but I won't get into too much detail here, it has to do with looking up others published systematic reviews and seeing what terms they used. Um, and so that's, that is something that I will, as a complement to this procedure, um, do. And then at a certain point, you kind of say, okay, I'm not finding any new terms, I'm done. Um, and that's for PubMed. That's that's to come up with the PubMed strategy. That's how I usually start. Then <clears throat> transitioning to a different database. So there's no reason why you should memorize this or know this or anything, but that search that I showed here, which is PubMed, this is the same search, but for Scopus. This is how you would, the syntax for doing that exact same search in Scopus. I'm not going to go into what the differences are, but that's where librarians come in. Um, that's what we do. We can help with, um, and I see there's some questions. I'm definitely going to come to those in one moment. We can help with that. And so when I talk with a faculty member or a student, we start with the question, we come up with an initial search strategy, and then we start to go through the process of finding more terms. If it's a faculty member, I may do more of the work. If it's a student, I may let them do more of the work of that, those iterations, because that's really an important part of learning systematic reviews. But then reformatting for a different database, that's often where I come in and I'll either do it or I'll show them the rules for doing it. Um, so the questions here, can you elaborate on brackets versus parentheses and uses of space? Yes, uh, let me. Let me do that. So the brackets or the parentheses are to separate each distinct concept, COVID-19, exercise, the elderly. Those are my three distinct concepts that I identified with my PO, elderly, physical activity, COVID. So those, each of those sets of synonyms that's related are in parentheses. They are separated by ands. And yes, you have to add and between each term because I'm saying I want articles that have any combination of these terms and any combination of these terms and any combination of these terms. That's how I'm defining my search. So 
the and is what separates distinct concepts. The or is what combines related concepts or synonyms. So all these synonymous terms are connected or, 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 but the distinct terms are separated by ands. Um, so the spaces I have, this is the sort of spacing for PubMed, you know, COVID-19 space, squared bracket mesh. The squared bracket is a PubMed thing where I'm saying, search for this term among mesh terms. This is a mesh term. I looked it up, I confirmed that this is a mesh term. So I'm telling PubMed, look for this among the mesh terms. Don't look in the titles, don't look in the abstracts, look in the mesh terms. For this, look in for this within the titles and the abstracts, T-I-A-B. Um, that's the squared bracket here. It's a command, it's like a formatting command to PubMed of where to look for that term. The squared bracket thing is not how other databases work, as you see here. For Scopus, it's this and then parentheses and phrases are in quotes. Because if you don't do it in quotes, it does physical or activity, which just becomes a mess. But I wanted to look for this phrase, so I put it in quotation marks. That's one of the rules that you wouldn't necessarily, like there's no reason you would know that. And that's again, where librarians come in. Um, so hopefully that helps with the brackets versus parentheses thing and the use of and. Um, for short, this is really the only two that I will typically use. Um, there's some occasions where, so for instance, if I'm looking for a systematic review, I'm going to put this in the, um, I'm going to put this in the chat. I might do something like, so I might say uh, diabetes mellitus and metformin and systematic review TI. That's if I'm looking for a systematic review about diabetes and metformin. Um, and the reason I do that is because a general rule of thumb is that if you write a systematic review, you're supposed to have the phrase systematic review in the title. That's one of the Prisma recommendations. Put the phrase systematic review in the title of your systematic review so it's findable in this way. Um, that's the only other one of these that I actually use myself. There's a lot of other um, syntax things with PubMed that I just don't get into because it gets way too complicated. Um, but anyway, so hopefully that answers those questions. Um, all right. So again, I'm, these are links basically where in the Cochrane Handbook, if you read chapter four, it says, have a librarian on your team. Um, so I'm not going to go to the link, but um, a lot of these resources, Cochrane, the Joanna Briggs Institute, Prisma, you know, these really leading organizations, they all recommend having librarians on your team for this, one of the reasons being for all of this stuff that I'm talking about, because this is not common sense or commonly known. Um, this was an article showing that I'm not going to go to it either for the sake of time, but this was an article showing um how uh oh it was showing that um systematic reviews that had a librarian on the team tended to be um better tended to hit more of the prisma the 27 prisma items um so anyway just a little plug for librarians here um so i see there's a question we'll come back uh so in conclusion we talked about transitioning your research question to a search strategy. I always start with PubMed and go through multiple iterations. And then once I feel quote unquote done, then I translate that search strategy for other databases. And I would highly recommend talking to a librarian. Um, if you want to work with a librarian um, from Himmelfarb, you can email us at this email address and you'll be assigned to a, a librarian who can help you um walk through this process that i showed so the question pubmed search builder i i per, i know some people really like that i'm not a big fan of it i guess um just because i'm used to doing it the way that i showed here it's it that comes down i think to more personal comfort if you like the pubmed search builder functionality which kind of guides you through this process that i did um you know by all means use that but 
it's just it's not something that I personally use, but it's not something that you need to use necessarily either. Part of it for me is that I know the squared brackets and I know all the little rules. So the search builder, I I don't tend to use that for that reason. Um, but it can be it can help you in form formulating and properly formatting a search in PubMed. Um, so thank you for the questions. Um, so thank you for your time. We will do another session. The next session will be in two weeks again, and this will be using Covidence. So I'm going to take a little bit of a detour from the systematic review process and talk about the use of Covidence, which is software that helps you perform systematic reviews. It's going to be same time, uh, two weeks, Wednesday at noon for half an hour, and it'll be in this WebEx room. Um, so that was all I wanted to talk about. I see we're slightly past 1230 and I really want to keep these to half an hour or less. So I'm going to stop there. And uh, so the recordings are available. Let me put the guide in. I have a guide that like a companion guide for this series. So once this recording is ready, I'm going to post it to that guide and the recordings for the past sessions are there. Also, the slide sets are there as well. Um, so that's where I put all the stuff from these classes is in, in that particular guide. I'll update it as soon as I can. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? If not, I'm just going to hang around here and uh, wait till uh, folks leave. And if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. So thank you to all of you. Thanks, Tom. Enjoyed it again. See you next time. All right. Thank you. See you next time. Bye-bye.